May I welcome you all uh, into AHN Nephrology webinar series number 23. Um, my name is Dr. Igina Francis Makwabe. I'm the consultant nephrologist and physician practicing uh, in Tanzania with uh, Africa Healthcare Network as a chief medical director. So on behalf of AHN and um, Dr. Lloyd with the chief medical officer and uh, Nick Hill, and all the team of AHN, um, I would like to uh, have the honor to introduce uh, Dr. Francis Furia, uh, who is a consultant pediatrician and nephrologist uh, at uh, Muhimbiri National Hospital and also College of Sciences. Uh, he's, uh, you know, last time uh, he chaired this session and today's the continuation of the last uh, week's session that was understanding the basics of peritoneal dialysis. And uh, Dr. Francis has a vast experience in peritoneal dialysis in Tanzania. And actually he's the guru and the champion of peritoneal dialysis in Tanzania. And uh, among the nephrologists who are practicing uh, uh, peritoneal dialysis in Tanzania, I think is I think it will be the number one PhD in internal dialysis. So, Dr. Francis, chair this session. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Makwabe, for that uh, uh, big introduction. Um, and, uh, it's, um, uh, it's an honor to uh, chair this second uh, part of the uh, webinar on peritoneal dialysis. And um, I'm, I'm, it's, it's such an nice uh, Hannah that uh, Dr. Tushar uh, has graced us with the first part of uh, basics of peritoneal dialysis and today we have uh, an opportunity again to go through the second part which is uh, complication and troubleshooting. Dr. Tushar Maladave is a nephrologist who is currently working at the University Health Network in Toronto. He has been trained in India and he's worked in India. He's uh, certified in US and he's also certified in, uh, in, 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 in Canada. And he's done a lot of work, uh, both in India and in Canada. And it was really, uh, we had an opportunity to hear the first part of this presentation. And I believe that uh, we, are, we will have another interesting uh, second part of paternal dialysis. Welcome, Dr. Tushar. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, thanks to Dr. Francis, and thanks Dr. McRobey. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity given to me. It's really wonderful, and I'm so happy to talk about uh, peritoneal analysis, which is like a really dear to me. I was trained in transplant, and later on I was trained in uh, peritoneal analysis as well. So it's really nice to uh, talk to uh, the audience in Africa who are uh, in enthusiastic about knowing peritoneal analysis, and I really appreciate you calling me. So again, I'm going with this uh, which tells about the advantages of living with peritoneal dialysis. I know it's not much used in Africa because of the resource limitations, but this is something which will be probably there in the next 10, 15 years as well. Okay. Now, uh, I have no to disclose. I don't have any financial disclaimers. Now, the agenda for today is um, I specifically I'm going to, I was supposed to do complications, cases, and uh, troubleshooting. But however, the talk is so long that I had to remove the cases and actually I just went through the theory. And I did uh, a special part for PD in diabetics because one of the uh, colleague from, had asked about this. The other thing is um, you know, there will be another slide about PD in special situations and then complications. We'll go to the complications and there's a lot of to cover in the complications. So uh, without much, I'm going to start. And please uh, feel free to interrupt and ask. I will be definitely asking in uh, between if anyone has doubts and uh, feel free to ask because I feel that if the questions are raised at that point of time in the flow, it is much better answered. Okay, so now going to the PD in diabetics because the pro problem is because of the peritoneal dialysis has sugar in it, glucose in it. And what do you do for the patient with diabetes? Because obviously the glucose levels will go up. The first question is, does PD offer any advantage over hemodialysis? Yes, the PD does offer an advantage over hemodialysis, at least in the first few months to an year. 
the studies have shown that the diabetics have an increased mortality in the first three to four months of on hemodialysis. And there, because of other various parameters, because of non-physiological changes or uh, history, here PDU definitely has an advantage. But what happens is, after one year or two years, essentially the curves do meet, and after five years, it's the same. Okay. Uh, the second thing that I can show you here is, uh, as you can see, is the solution. How much is the solution that is used? And as you can see, if you have got 1.5%, the amount of glucose absorbed is 15 to 22 grams. 2.5% is 24 to 40 grams. And that's the increased amount of glucose absorption. So obviously we do want to use the glucose, but try to avoid using the uh, hypertonic glucose solutions. Now, again, I have told him in my last talk that the use of hypertonic glucose solution should be there when you are having ultrafiltration failure or the patient is having, having uh, volume overload like pulmonary edema, okay? So the way to avoid using 4.25 is educating the patient. As, as what I tell to the patients is the salt is the poison here. Always have less salt in the diet, means there will be less amount of fluid to be ultrafiltered. So you can use less amount of 4.25%. The way to go around this is also trying to use something known as glucose sparing set strategy usually using icodextrin. Now, icodextrin is not, it's supposedly not to, to get absorbed, but also it does not contribute to the glucose levels. Okay? The requirement of uh, insulin is much less when the patient is on icodextrin. Okay? Now, also, because the patient, diabetic patients have been shown to have high transport status, as we recall, <clears throat> transport status is the amount of transport that happens uh, in the peritoneal membrane. And because of that, they are more likely to be on the cycler as compared to the CAPD. Okay? And PD in diabetics is associated uh, just as increased glucose levels. It, because you get increased glucose levels, it contributes to weight gain, obesity. And because of that, you have hyperinsulinemia. When you have hyperinsulinemia, there is so many problems associated, as we all know. I'm not going to reiterate those. Hyperlipidemia is again one of those problems in which the glucose gets converted to the triglycerides, and that gives rise to hyperlipidemia. So what do you do? So you do monitor the glucose levels, but the problem of glucose levels in PD is obviously you can monitor with glycosylated hemoglobin, but HB1C, as we have, has its fallacies in the disease patients. The other component is you can use glycosylated albumin. Now, glycosylated albumin is not something that we use routinely, at least not in Canada here, not in my center or Toronto, but it is the, the papers are there from Europe and Australia. What about the use of oral hypoglycemic agents? You can use a few of them, like uh, linagliptin or citagliptin, but you're going to avoid using the other uh, sulfonyl uh, uh, group of drugs. Now you can use insulin as well, but you can use it in, and you can use it intraperitoneal, but I would strongly like, you can use it so as to avoid dosing it in the subcutaneous. But the problem is there's always a risk of peritonitis because you're breaking the barrier and you're puncturing the fluid back, right? So I would suggest it's like, it's, it's doable, but try to avoid it. And it's also associated with hepatic subcapsular steatosis. It doesn't, this is a terminology that you'll know, but it's there, but it doesn't have any clinical significance. Now, also in diabetics, what they have found out is they lose their renal function quite fast. So by the end of like one or two, two to three years, that's the reason why, as we know that uh, as there is a faster loss of residual renal function with, uh, in diabetics, Maybe that's the reason why the patient may be having a mortality, a benefit at the first year, but at the end of two or three years, they are almost the same as hemodialysis. So considering that, is we are to remember that focus on the nutrition because there can be a loss of albumin in diabetics. So the patient may have high transport status. Also, the patients may have gastroparesis and that time you don't want to fill the fluid in the belly because that is going to get affected. The gastroparesis is going to get affected. So you may want to use a low volume during the meals. You can use prokinetics like metoclopramide or like domperidone or any antibiotic like azithromycin. 
and use frequent small tweaks. Now, this is nothing but our internal medicine knowledge, nothing specifically um, high, high fundamental nephrology. Also, patients with diabetes can have diabetic retinopathy. And so, the problem in diabetic retinopathy, it can be leading to visual impairment. And visual impairment can also lead to sometimes dry and wet contamination and can lead to calcinosis. Also, patients can have amputations, so that's why their mobility can be affected. And because their mobility can be affected, you can imagine that the glucose levels will be high in when the patient is having on PD. Now, those are the only two slides that I could gather because of the long talk. There's so much to talk about uh, diabetes in the PD. But I'm going to talk about a further about a few other situations in which PD can be used successfully. You can definitely use PD in patients with liver transplant, lung transplant, and heart transplant. I especially get referrals for cardiorenal syndromes because in case if the patient gets LVAD, which is left ventricular assist device, would the patient do well on PD? Actually, they do quite well because the hemodialysis needs blood pressure. And as you know, that LVAD has a low blood pressure. That's why peritoneal dialysis patients do well. Kidney transplant, what do you do if a patient is on kidney transplant and has to get to do PD? Usually what we do is because the kidneys is extra peritoneal and when you have to do a peritoneal, um, peritoneal di dialysis, it is not a problem, you can do it. The only thing is because for peritoneal dialysis, we need a good urine output. We want to continue with the immunosuppression. Now, when you're on immunosuppression, your immunity is less, and there is always a risk of getting peritonitis. But not much, like it's not been shown as much as what you would think in a patient who, uh, as compared to the general population. Now, colostomy. Now, this is a very special situation in which do you do peritoneal dialysis in patients with colostomy or any stoma, like ileostomy? You can, okay? So what happens is if you have a colostomy or ileostomy in the belly, and which is well established, and then the patient needs a peritoneal dialysis, then you can insert a peri peritoneal dialysis catheter. The way you can do it is basically get the catheter at the sternum or in the anterior or very much away from the bag of the colostomy, okay? And then it can do well. But now let's try to the, think of the other way. A patient who's on peritoneal dialysis needs a colostomy. That's not good because when you have colostomy, you are going to make an uh, incision on the abdomen and then you're going to bring out the colon. That always invariably leads to peritonitis, leaks, corneas, it doesn't heal. So it's probably suggested not to do a colostomy in a patient with peritoneal dialysis. If you want to do a colostomy in a patient with peritoneal dialysis, there are the chances that it can be done, but there are chances that there will be peritonitis and you may actually get transferred to hemodialysis. Okay. Same holds true for the PEG or gastrostomy tubes. Like if it is the patient has a gastrostomy tube which is well established, everything is healed, and then you can do the peritoneal dialysis. It's not an issue. But if you, the patient is on peritoneal dialysis and wants to get a gastrostomy tube, you're going to get problems. Uh, Suprapubic catheters shouldn't be a problem because suprapubic catheters are actually extra peritoneal because of, uh, there's a reflection of the peritoneum which goes above the bladder, so shouldn't be a problem. Shouldn't be giving rise to any um, peritonitis. However, if the skin infection there and if our, our uh, PD catheter exit site is very near, it can be a problem. For pe female patients who are having intrauterine devices, it shouldn't be a problem because it is in the uterus. However, we know that patients with intrauterine devices have slightly extra increased association of infection of the PD peritonitis and sometimes fungal infections as well. So be careful about that and just to let the patients know. Uh, but however, if the patient is on dialysis, one thing is getting rate of concern is quite less, but if they have it already in, in C2, then you can have peritone dialysis. I already mentioned about the heart failure patients in which there is a cardiovascular syndrome because the blood pressure is quite well maintained. It is continuous dialysis. It's really good amount of dialysis that we can do. There's not much of shifts of the blood pressures of fluid shift. So it's a really good therapy for cardiovascular syndrome. In fact, the cardiovascular syndrome patients can get away by one exchange a day, like trailers. And we have patients here whom we start on like one exchange or two exchanges a day. We don't have to go by four exchanges or five exchanges. If you have liver failure and ascites, uh, the PD catheter 
actually helps with parasynthesis. So the one thing that is a teaching point here is if you are doing a PD and the patient is having too much of ultrafiltration, then you have to think whether the patient is having some other source of having a fluid out, which is draining out. And there you go. And when we have found out that the patient has cirrhosis there. Here, the PD catheter, you don't have to actually put on this much amount of fluid as much what you need, but a small amount of fluid can be also sufficient because once you drain out the patient, these body feel better with it. Now, can you do swimming with peritoneal dialysis? Uh, patients do swimming with peritoneal dialysis only if they are swimming in the ocean because salt is good. It is sort of an antibacterial or else if it is in the pool where there's a chloride. We don't ask, we don't tell the patients to swim in the fresh water or lakes. That's not because it, it will come up with infections. Okay. Visual impairment, as I mentioned about the diabetic retinopathy, can it be, can PD be done in a blind person? Yes, it can be done if it is properly taught. And also there are machines which have been there. Also, if someone can do it, like a caregiver can do it, or as in here in Canada, we have something as home plus in which a nurse goes to the patient's home and does the dialysis. Last thing is, what if you have pets at home? So pets, dogs are okay, but the cats can be dangerous. Both of them can be dangerous. Cats will like to sit on the cycler machine because it is a, it's a warm, it's, and as you know, the cats like to stay at a warm place. So, and that's a problem there. There can be also, because the tubing is a, like a playful thing, a toy for the cats, they can start doing, a, like they can nick it, they can bite it, and there have been incidences in which there is a pastoral lositida infections because of the cats and dogs at home. So more of what we suggest to the patient is don't get the pets in the room where the PD is being done. Now, have, it's easy to say than being done, but we still try to enforce it. Okay, now coming to the complications. So now this is broadly, I have classified complications in forms of infections, metabolic, then catheter related, hernias, leaks, and encapsulating peritoneal sclerosis, which is a really dangerous and bad uh, complication. And then we have ultrafiltration failure. Now, I'm not going to say much about ultrafiltration failure because I think I covered it last time because uh, it's basically changing the characteristics of the membrane. You have to do either rapid cycles or you have to change the dialysis to HD. Okay. Any questions so far, friends? In the question box. Uh, I can see that Dr. Mubarak Jan Mohammed is uh, mentioned. It is very helpful. The transplant surgeons mentioned in their post of notes is the peritoneal breach. Absolutely. So when a new kidney has been put inside the belly, it's supposed to be extra peritoneum. But if they nick the peritoneum in a patient who is already on peritoneal, that's not good. Then I, I, I hate it because we have to insert a dialysis catheter. We have to insert a HD catheter to do dialysis. If the patient has a DGF, that's a delayed heart function. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed, for this. Okay, so now the infectious complications can be broadly classified into peritonitis and catheter related. And the catheter related are two exit site, which means only purulent discharge, nothing else. You can have redness, you can have stick, uh, itching, you can have swelling, but if you have pus there, that's an inf infection. Okay. Second thing is the tunnel infection. Tunnel infection means if you touch the tunnel and the patient is having pain, that's a sign of inflammation and that's infection. Okay? If you have swelling, redness, or edema, and tenderness on the tunnel, that means the patient has an infection. Or else the patient may not have anything, but you see that you get some, uh, I will show you an ultrasound, and it shows a collection around the catheter. That means the patient is having a tunnel infection. Okay, so let's talk about peritone, PD peritonitis. So which organisms are common? The most common organism is Staph aureus, gram positive, okay? The reason is pretty simple, it's from the skin. As you can see, the gram positive is Staphylococcus aureus and then coagulus negative uh, Staphylococcus species, which is contaminant, but given in the right context, it is an infection which needs to be treated. The second organisms, uh, the second group is gram negative and out of which you see the one of the nastiest organisms is pseudomonas. E. coli is there as well. E. coli and pseudomonas both come from the gut 
but the pseudomonas is something which takes over the catheter. So you have to be very careful about how you treat pseudomonas. Lastly, but not the least, are really nastier ones is fungus. Mycobacterium is almost 1%. Then polymicrobial growth. When you have polymicrobial growth, that means there's a problem, the breach in the continuity of the GI tract. Okay. Then you can also have culture negative. For some reason, so the patient had peritonitis. Someone gives some antibiotic and then you try to treat it, but you can't find it. That means the, there's no bug in that peritoneum, but you do have the high cell counts. And it's good because it's being treated. So if you have culture negative peritonitis, you just treat for two weeks. And I'll come to the durations as well now. So what are the risk factors for peritonitis? So obviously, as you can see, this is the risk factors are related to the general well-being of the patient. Okay. If you're smoking, if you're living away from the PD unit, that means there's not much of follow-up, which is very common in uh, places up north in Canada here, which is like nearer to the more icier uh, places. Or if you have pets, the other is our obesity, means you're not able to see the exit site or you're not able to see the catheter properly. Depression, if you don't want to do proper steps. Hypokalemia is the reason why hypokalemia causes infection is there are two way, two mechanisms. Is one thing is there might be associated gut hypomotility, which causes more movement of bacteria from the gut to the peritoneum, or there is dif differences of the fighting ab ability of the WBCs in the peritoneum. Lastly, uh, means not lastly, there's a hypoalbinemia, means there's less immunity, means the patient doesn't have much nutrition. That is a bad prototype of the patient. Absence of vitamin D supplementation, these are all uh, studies which have shown that. And then if you have an invasive intervention, like a colonoscopy or a GI scopy or a, like a dental, um, like a cleaning, and you get peritonitis, you know that what is the cause of it. Dialysis related, what have been shown from the epidemiological studies is prior dialysis, or else if you're doing the PD against the patient's choice, obviously it's going to be negligent with the PD. If the training has not been done or has to be, if you start getting again and again, you have a center which is having too many incidences of peritoneal dialysis infection, then you have to think of the training. Maybe the staff need this training properly rather than the patient, okay? If you're using bio incompatible fluids, like more amount of glucose levels can also give rise to, uh, because of the pH, and the more amount of bio incompatible fluids means more pH, more amount of uh, decreased immunity in the fluid. Wet contamination, I'll come to what is a wet contamination is. Wet contamination means if you have got the fluid coming to the catheter and is open in which the fluid is either coming out and it's falling down somewhere, that means the catheter was exposed and it is exposed to the environment. When it is exposed to the environment with the fluid going in and out is known as wet contamination. However, if the clamps are there and the fluid is not exposed but the catheter is exposed, it's a dry contamination. So it's a very different uh, terminology, wet contamination and dry contamination. When the fluid is there, you'll say wet. When there's no fluid out, it's dry. When you have fluid there, you have to treat it. When you don't have fluid, you don't have to treat it, but you have to monitor it. Okay, then comes infection. If, you are, if the patient is again and again having nasal, uh, like picking noses or any, uh, which is a carrier state of staph aureus. And if the patient has a previous exit site infection, that's again a risk factor for peritonitis. Okay, so the criteria for PD peritonitis is two out of three. Always remember, it has to satisfy two out of three. There can be three always, but if, you, if this doesn't satisfy two out of three, then you have to rethink whether this is peritonitis or not. The first is you have abdominal pain or cloudy effluent. Many times the patient may not have abdominal pain, so if, but still they will say that, oh, I have got this cloudy fluid. Second criteria is if your cell count is more than 100 with more than 50% polyneutrophils, uh, basically. I had a patient with 180 cell count, but the neutrophils were just 30. I knew it was lymphocytosis. Obviously, I had to look for something else, but that is the second category. You have to have neutrophils in that fluid. And third is, obviously, if you have a culture positive. So out of two out of three, if you get those criteria, then you make a diagnosis of PD peritonitis and you start treating immediately. So, what is the differential diagnosis of a cloudy effluent? If it is not PD peritonitis, what can it be? So obviously it can be, it can be infectious as I mentioned. It can be infectious peritonitis with sterile cultures. So 
it can be something which the cultures are not going to pick up like TB, which is going to show up after some time or sometimes weird and wonderful organisms which are not going to grow in those cultures routinely. Sometimes you do get chemical peritonitis. What is chemical peritonitis is nothing but if uh, new stuff is in the peritoneum which is going to cause irritation like a new, peri uh, new catheter or else icodextrin. Those gives, can give rise to chemical peritonitis or an antibiotics. Okay? Sometimes our amlodipine, nephidipine, nicardipine, felidipine can give rise to this as well. Eosinophilia of the effluent, there is a big differential for the eosinophilia of the effluent, which can give rise to cloudy effluent. Hemoperitoneum, I'll come to hemoperitoneum in the later slides. Then you've got malignancy, pilus effluent, and then if the specimen was taken from a dry abdomen, that means if the patient had not done a PD for a day, and you suddenly send a sample, the first sample that you do, and it shows high cell count, that is a dry abdomen specimen. Don't make your diagnosis on that particular sample. Okay, so now what are the anti empiric antibiotics? As soon as you get the patient who comes complains of having a cloudy effluent or abdominal pain, just start the antibiotics. Don't wait for the cell count. Don't wait for any culture. Just start the antibiotics. The antibiotics are done as for the center specific. So it has to be uh, driven by the center. But if you don't have any specific centers, just follow the ISPD guidelines, which is really good. And what you do is when you're going to cover a blanket antibiotic, which is enteric empiric antibiotic, cover both gram positive and gram negative. So with the gram positive, you cover with first generation cephalosporin or vancomycin. In gram negative, you cover with third generation cephalosporin or amygdalocytes. Now, this is really important here because the ISPD guidelines have those first generation cephalosporins, but the amount of resistance for first generation cephalosporins is so much. Like in countries where there is too many, too much of use of antibiotics rampantly without any particular thought or like anyone who gives, there you can get a resistance. And that's the place where you have to be careful about what antibiotics you're using. That's why center specific becomes important here. So what are the terminologies for peritonitis? So there are a few terminologies which they say it's recurrent, relapse or repeat. Or what, are, what does that mean? Okay. So in the recurrent, it means it's a different organism, but the duration of the second infection happened less than four weeks. So you say recurrent, different. That's how I re remember it's current and different. Relapse means it's the S is here. It's the same organism, but less than four weeks. Repeat means it's the same organism, but after four weeks. And refractory is cloudy effluent at day five. Okay. And what is catheter related peritonitis? That means if you've got an infection of the exit side or the tunnel, and then you get a peritonitis. Okay, now why do we bother about this recurrent, relapse, re re repeat or refractory peritonitis? Is because relapsing means there is some problem. Okay, you have to look into this problem neatly or more closely. Okay, there's a lower rate of cure, more ultrafiltration problems, and higher rate of technique failure. That means the patient would get transferred to hemodialysis. That's the problem with the relapsing. If you've got recurrent, that means you've got different organisms each time, it's even worse. You have higher chances of PD fail, uh, technique failure, and that's why you have a chance of transfer to the uh, hemodialysis and also associated with mortality. Okay. Okay, so now how do you treat? You treat with intraperitoneal medications, and that's the preferred route. And what do you treat? Is amino glycosides. You want to treat it for two to three weeks avoid prolonged courses like more than three or four weeks. Then you have vancomycin and you target the level as 15. Again, you do it only intraperitoneal or else you can use cephalosporins, which is intraperitoneal or intermediate or continuous. That is intraperitoneal, okay, not IV. Nowhere, nowhere here I have mentioned IV or oral, okay. And why am I saying that? It's because when you do intraperitoneal, it's higher concentration in the peritoneum. You don't have to do a venous or IV uh, putting in the med, uh, antibiotic. The levels as compared to the, to the IV, the IP are actually much higher and they remain in there for five or six, or three to five days as compared to IV in which you may have to do it every two or three days. Okay? And then also IV vancomycin had higher rates of failure in the past studies. That's why IP is preferred. 
Now, busy slide, I don't want to read, but these are all the antibiotics that you can use intraperitoneal. You can see amino glycosides, cephalosporins, penicillins, and all this stuff, and antifungals as well. They are, these are all the, as you can see, the, the, the source here is ISPD peritonitis recommendations. Again, you can use other medications as well. Now, this is if you're not using IP, you can use oral or IV. So you can see this cipro, cholestin, artapenum, these are all IV or oral, not IP. Okay. Okay. Now, if it is gram positive, what do you do? So when you have a gram positive culture, I'm just going to walk you through this slide. You basically use start treating empirically and do whether the patient has a clinical improvement or not. If you don't have, you'll have to see. If you have a culture which is suggestive of coagulous negative staphylococcus treat for 14 days. So this is our uh, cons, our staph epidemiologists. But if you have staph aureus, you have to respect it. Treat it for 21 days, okay? If it is enterococci, though it is a gram positive, you treat it as gram negative because this is a really a nasty bug. It, it may need a double antibiotic coverage like if it is severe, you may have want to add an intraperitoneal amino glycoside as well. And then other streptococci, which are again like, like a cons treat for 14 days. Okay. So what is what you need to understand is gram positive peritonitis, the treatment duration is two to three weeks. The three weeks ones are stat and intrococcus, so rest all are two weeks. Okay. Okay. Now, what are the certain organisms and what can it lead to? So Remember, if you got a relapsing, that is the same organism, less than four weeks, and you treated it, but you get the, again the same organism, then you think of biofilm on the catheter. Then you may have to think about catheter removal. So there you go, the relapsing peritonitis. If you have got enterococcus, they're always resistant to cephalosporin, though it may show you that it is sensitive to cephalosporin, but, the, but it invariably develops a resistance, and that you may want to treat with vancomycin, and as I mentioned, intraperitoneal amino glycosis. So it will read, it will need two antibiotics if the infection is really nasty. It is associated with high risk of catheter removal, high risk of permanent hemodialysis, and high risk of death. So enterococcus species are always respected in peritonitis. Okay. We have to take care of this species quite well. What if it is strep bovis? Obviously, strep bovis, our medicine knowledge, look at the colon. There must be some malignancy. Or else, what if it is strep meridans? This is from the oral or genital, right? And it's more likely to be refractory. You may want to treat it for a longer period of time. Depends on whether the uh, uh, fluid becomes clear or cloudy or the cell counts are not settled down. What if it's staph? Okay, staph is one thing that you, you always say, okay, there is a staph there. The staph is often from the exit side of the tunnel infection and always treat, always look for the exit side of tunnel. Never ever disregard that okay if you get a staph in the peritoneum always look at the exit side or sometimes people may treat the nose as well in which they put mucurosin in the nasal cavity what if it is corinibacterium now corinibacterium as you can know that they, they can be on the skin and anywhere and the problem with this is you think it is contaminant but it's not it actually is has a moderate risk of catheter removal so you need to treat it properly treat it with three weeks of intraperitoneal vancomycin if you have got a concomitant exit site and a tunnel infection, you have to think of uh, removal of the catheter. Okay, again, a busy slide, gram-negative bacilli. I'm not going to go all this, but what you need to do is, after you do the uh, empiric, see what you grow. Pseudomonas or stenotrophomonas, other gram-negative or mixed gram-negative or gram-positive. What you need to do is, if this pseudomonas or trophomonas, you have to treat with antibiotics for, see here, three to, whole, three to four weeks. Other gram-negative acid is three weeks. Other gram, if you get any gram-negative, you have to do, go for three weeks. So the bottom line is, if you have gram-negative, at least three weeks, sometimes it has to go to four weeks, okay? And what is the characteristics of gram-negative peritonitis? So if you've got pseudomonas, the pseudomonas, is associated with increased hospitalization, higher rate of uh, catheter removal, more than 40%, permanent hemodialysis transfer. Unfortunately, this patient really get burnt out. And you have to treat it to anti pseudomonal antibiotics. Usually, it will be like third generation uh, cephalosporin or and uh, aminoglycoside or a fluoroquinolone, which is active against uh, pseudomonas. 
the duration will be three to four weeks. What if you have spice organisms? Now, spice, as you know, has been associated with uh, infectious leukocytosis. These organisms are notorious. They cause high rate of relapse, and they will need two antibiotics as as good as pseudomonas. So I usually treat them as pseudomonas, and they have they inactivate the beta lactamase. So we have to go for carbapenems or uh, fluoroquinolones or septra or aminoglycosides. These are the spice organisms characteristics. What if it is Streptococcus? Now this is a one organism which comes after therapy is finished, and you get this thing, which is because of the antibiotic exposure in the past. The treatment is usually, as I mentioned, carbapenem, fluoroquinolones, or third generation cephalosporins, or else septra. Septra is the drug of choice for Streptococcus, and the treatment will be for three to four weeks again. Here. Okay. What if you've got more than one organism that is polymicrobial? Always look at the GI tract, which is probably ruptured or having a problem there. Okay? The patients will present as sepsis, hypotension, lactic acidosis. You may need to open up the belly because either there's a, a problem with the colon or intestine. You may need a surgical opinion. CT scan can be normal, but if you get two organisms there, you have to look into this. The therapy is IV metronidazole, obviously because of the uh, gram positive anaerobes, IP vancomycin, and IP aminoglycosylar cephalidazine. So the, you are using three med medications here. You have to treat it for three weeks. Very high risk of catheter being removed here. However, if you get both organisms which are gram positive, it's easy treatment. Don't have to worry. So remember, friends, if you have got gram negative, you are in a problem. If you've got two gram negative, big problem, but if they're gram positive, both of them, it's not a big problem, okay? Okay, what else do you do for peritonidal? Never forget, nystatin, because what happens is when you treat PD peritonidal with antibiotics, fungus is come along after two to three weeks. That's why always remember to take, and the fungus origin is from the GI tract. That's why make it from the mouth, Swish and swallow it so it goes and takes away all the candida away. You always use heparin if there are a lot of uh, fibrin strands in the fluid so that it, the catheter does not get blocked. And send daily cell count and cultures alternately to document that negative. You have to have at least one or two the cultures negative to document, say that the patient is being treated or being cleared. Other peritonitis is fungal, which is associated with higher rates of infection, death and relapse and these patients are really sick. You have to get the surgeons involved early and you have to get the catheter out early. And the surgeons will take, in, take the patients to the OR immediately within like 24 hours. They don't treat it as class C case, but they know that if they know that the patient, this is associated, the more time is associated with more mortality, they should be taking the patient to the OR immediately. Okay. Other stuff is PD, TB peritonitis. This is seen in patients who have been uh, migration or patients who have been exposed to the endemic areas of TB, like in Asia or in Africa or in like uh, South America, there you can get lymphocytosis in the PDF. You may get neutrophils as well, but lymphocytosis is the main uh, clue. You may want to get a DNA PCR, and then the best is to get a biopsy, and then therapy is anti TB. Now, I've mentioned it's high risk of catheter removal. The older days, they used to remove the PD at the TB. Patients with uh, they used to remove the catheter, but now we can still salvage the catheter and you can use it as well. So coming to the last slide of this is how do you remove? When do you remove the PD catheter? If you've got a refractory, relapsing, refractory infections in the exit side or tunnel side, or a co-infection with the peritonitis and uh, exit side and uh, tunnel infection. If you have a fungal peritonitis. And consider the removal if you've got multiple episodes of peritonitis, that means there is a biofilm there, or you've got TB there, or multiple enteric organisms. How do you prevent it? So always remember that do the prophylaxis before the procedures. And the procedures are pretty, almost all the procedures, like you put a scope inside the mouth, you want to give it. You put a scope inside the colon, you want to do it. You want to put a scope in a bronchoscope, you want to do it because bronchoscope, the respiratory epithelia will have bacteria. Cystoscopy as well, as well as ERCP. Dental procedures, of course we have to give it. It's the same as what infectoendocarditis is. And again, if you have got a gynecological procedures like 
uh, pure touch or a DNC or some biopsy in the uh, in the in the uterus, you want to do it. Not for routine pap smear. You don't need to do it because you are not going to breach anything unless there's a bite of the cervix. Liver biopsy, obviously, because you you are going to breach the peritoneum, you are going to put a needle inside the biopsy, so it is going. There's a source of infection. You may you also want to for a gram positive. I haven't put the medications here, but it depends on what procedure it is, and then you have to treat, uh, give the prophylaxis accordingly. And never forget, drain the abdomen before any procedures, okay? Because if something goes wrong, if you have to do a CPR, at least the belly uh, doesn't have any fluid. Okay, now coming to the exit side and tunnel infection. Uh, friends, any questions, please, about the peritonitis, PD peritonitis? Uh, uh, thank you very much, Tusha. Uh, I just wanted to ask um, for the intraperitoneal treatment with antibiotics. Yeah. Uh, so even if uh, the patient has developed a systemic disease, I mean symptoms like fever and general body, um, antibiotics treatment. Yes. Very good question. Uh, is it Francis? Uh, Makwabe. Oh, hi, Dr. Makwabe. Thank you. Very good question. Yes. So the question is, if the patient has systemic signs of infection, if the patient is system is like septic, then you do want to treat it IV. But any other local infection, which is not beyond, like, for example, a patient with peritonitis, they are not usually septic, okay? So the, the peritonitis is usually monitored, uh, managed as an outpatient. If they are hypotensive, high lactate, high WC counts, you know that the patient is in bacteremia, then I would do some IV antibiotics, but also I would like to do an IV antibiotics. The therapy for IP is also, most of the times is concentrated on the outside the peritoneal, means uh, outpatient. If the patient has intraperitoneal source of infection, and you want to think whether this is the source and you do stop the antibiotics there, means you do stop the PD there, you do IV antibiotics. But what you do is in a day, you put six hours of the antibiotics, you don't do the PD, you rest the peritoneum there. So you may want to do IP, IV plus IP or IV only, but with IP sometimes associated if the patient is frankly in sepsis and ICU. I hope that solves your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Another question here. Yeah, uh, yeah this is Dr. Narinwa from, uh, from, from Rwanda, Kigali. Hi. I'm fine, hi. Yeah, it's, it's, thank you very much for the educative uh, uh, you know, uh, you talk on uh, peritonitis. Now, but yeah, I, I, I just have one question. C can you please comment on the use of aminoglycosides in a patient with the kidney dysfunction and you want to preserve the renal function as much as possible? Excellent. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, my friend, uh, usually we, what we do is I ask how much is the urine output. If the urine output is really good, I do not want to use amino glycosides as much as easily, okay? If the patient has a good urine output, which is anything about 200 ml, I would try to avoid using amino glycosides. So I would like to preserve that residual renal function. Now, but if the patient, this is a, like a nasty bug, like pseudomonas or enterococcus, I may want to use it. The amount of residual renal function loss with the amino glycosides is more when it is more than for three or four weeks, okay? And then you also monitor the levels of the antibiotics. So the levels for uh, tobramycin or uh, I mean, uh, uh, gentamicin have to be monitored. And the level is, I think, less than two. So before you are, if the dose is, if the level is more than two, you don't give the next dose, you wait. If the level is less than two, you do it. Now, can I say that this is not going to affect the kidney? It may affect the kidney, but what's more important is making sure that the patient is alive to have the kidney, to have the peritoneal dialysis. Okay. Sir, if you have a fungus, you definitely take out the catheter, isn't it? Absolutely. The fungus, there's no, there's no choice. Just take it out. I've seen that people may they they are lulled. That's like okay, the counts are less. Let's 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 watch. Let's watch. Let's watch. Day three, like they come in ten thousand. Day five, there's like uh, hundred. And day seven, 
500, day 8, 9, or 1000, and you get fungus, never do that mistake. Just remove the catheter because the fungus is not going to get treated unless the catheter comes out. Always remember, as it is the dogma is, plastic anywhere in the body, anywhere, has to come out if there is a fungemia. Okay? There's also a comment. A comment. So I, I can see that uh, Mubarak Jain Mohammed mentioned interesting in the UK, we use IP Jain for every exchange, but we close the market. Yeah, it is. it depends on the, the center. We usually don't use every exchange. We use once a day, but we'll always monitor the uh, levels because that's what we do. Usually, we'll uh, once we do the tobramycin, we'll call it up uh, before we want to give the tobramycin or gentamicin. We'll give, get the levels before we do the second uh, second exchange with the tobra or genta. Thank you. Okay, I'm moving on now. This is something that I guys want to see. This is my PD patient, and the patient came in hypertension, some abdominal pain, some. Uh, cloudy and there you see this was leaking out pus here so this is exit side infection there's not redness there's no swelling it's actually pus okay so guys uh, friends remember it is the pus which determines whether it's exit site or not okay okay so now coming to what is the most commonest organisms the most commonest organisms are skin staph aureus and pseudomonas the bad things happen to the exit site always and these are the bad things that you have to take care properly to avoid them going in and causing peritonitis. Because remember, when you have an exit site infection and a tunnel infection, and if you have concomitant peritonitis, that means the catheter has to come out. So if you've got exit site and the tunnel, treat it aggressively because there you want, you don't want the infection to go further in. Okay. Well, you can you can have failures that are different, but you try to treat it aggressively. Okay. And what happens is in the exit side, the features is if you have exit side with purulence plus minus redness, that's okay. But in the tunnel, you can get erythema, edema, induration, or tenderness over the subcutaneous pathway. And I'll show you one, I'll show you multiple photos that you'll understand what I'm going to tell you. Why is this important? Because 20% of the peritonitis have preceding exit side infections. Out of that, all exit site, 10%, 5 to 10% will need a catheter removal. You really want to treat it. You don't want the PD catheter removal. It's like, if you're a PD doctor like me, the worst thing for me is to leave my, lose my patient on HD. Well, obviously, if he has to, if it is a very nasty infection, yes. But otherwise, if I can do something which can prevent him to migration to HD or which can prevent him to get septic is this infections, okay? Okay. Now you've got some scoring sites. So this is the uh, again from ISPD guidelines. You got zero point and look at here. You have got swelling, crust, redness, pain, drainage. And it's more of the drainage, which is purer. You get to the highest points here, two points. So this is here, okay, my friends. This is going to be exit site here. You can see this is the cuff here, and this is the tunnel of the catheter in the subcutaneous tissue and then this is the second cup and then this is the bill. So if this is the exit side and this is the tunnel infection that I'm trying to tell you. When do you want to investigate for the tunnel is if you think that there's some infection, there's some swelling, tenderness or erythema and if there is an in, you involvement of the exit side then you immediately get the tunnel in, evaluated okay or else you started to treat and you want to see what has happened, whether the collection has gone down or not. And if the patient has a relapsing peritonitis, that means there's again a negative peritonitis, you don't find any disease, any other cause, you look at the tunnel, okay? So this is my patient, and as you can see, this is the, this is the catheter, this is the lumen of the catheter, and look at this collection here, okay? This is the collection of the Catheter, uh, around the catheter. So this is an ultrasound. And this is, if you put the probe here and it is cutting the catheter in the transfer section, you can see this is a collection here. So now coming to what, how do you treat? So you treat with both. Again, you should cover the staph aureus. That's the most commonest organism. And you treat it with pseudomonas if there's a past history. Uh, sorry, I should take back my words that you shouldn't treat with both, but you start at least with the cephal cephalexin oral, okay? Here you treat it orally, not IP, okay? Always it's the therapy, as you mentioned, as you can see, is ISPD mentions is oral th therapies here. 
So now I'm moving on to the catheter dysfunction. Any questions for the exit side and tunnel infections? So catheter dysfunction means what happens with the catheter? If the catheter is not able to drain or it's not doing its job properly, always first think of constipation. Always say that patients with PD means they have to poop daily. That's what I always tell my patients and that's what I learned from Dr. Bangman as well here. It depends on what you got. You have got an inflow or an outflow problem. If the fluid can go, can go in but cannot come out or the fluid cannot go in at all. If it is both, then you have got kinks or clamps or you may have a fibrin plug or when, if the fluid can go in but doesn't come out, that means it's more likely a omentum or a fimbria. Okay, so fibrin plugs are very common and you have to look for that. You have to educate the patients to see for the fibrin plug and they'll tell you, yeah, I saw the fibrin. Immediately you should know that you have to put in heparin there because you don't want the catheter to get blocked immediately. But the first and foremost thing is always ask the patient, are you constipated? Patients will tell you, yes, I'm not constipated. They, they will say that, yeah, they will have hormones. And then still you have catheter dysfunction. You get an x-ray and you will see that the colon is full of feces. That's why you just make sure that the patient is having two or three good bowel movements a day if you have got this catheter dysfunction. It's a good thing to advise them to have uh, laxatives because laxatives not only get the uh, ball movement going, it will help the catheter to work. And as well as if the catheter doesn't work, at least the potassium gets out, okay? So laxatives and ball movement regimens should be reinforced to all the patients with PD, okay? Now, if you have got a fibrin plug, you use heparin flushes, okay? The dose is pretty uh, standard, it's 1,000 units per liter, or uh, especially for the heparin, okay? Or else you're still not able to get this, get, a chest, uh, get an abdominal x-ray, look at the position of the catheter, look at the fecal loading, or if there's any kink, okay? It's still not, you can try the tissue plasminogen activator, which is tenic place or any other uh, urokinase or, and it's still not, uh, unfortunately, the patient has to go for a catheter manipulation, either guide wire, but there are not many in this center to do a guide wire. The patient has to go either surgical, that's open laparotomy or a laparoscopy. Sometimes intervention radiology can also do a catheter manipulation, and that's also helpful when you want to get it faster. So these are the two x-rays in which you can see that the catheter has gone, migrated on the right upper side, this is the liver. Look at the stools here, so much amount of stools. It's fully loaded. The patient will complain, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not constipated. No, it's not. So the therapy here would be obviously, I would just suggest aggressive bowel regimen. Maybe with the movement of the bowel movement, this catheter will come down here and that would actually help with the catheter movement. The same thing is look around here. This catheter also is moved on the right side, but look here, you can see the poop here, like the feces. Again, there's a gases there. That means the patient is definitely constipated. Get him out to have a more amount of feces. If still not, unfortunately, you'll have to come down and get a reposition here. What does the fibrin plug look like? You can see that this is the catheter. And from this catheter was this fibrin plug pulled out. It can be really bad stuff. Okay, this is a very good example and I put uh, got it from the KI, uh, KD International, but it is basically, you if you can imagine if something has to go and um, there's no way that a catheter can work if you've got a big fibrin uh, plug here. Okay, what about a fallopian tube? In female patients, what happens is the fallopian tubes, they come and just kiss the catheter. They try to get inside it and that forms the problem. So it's a more of like an outflow issues, okay? So it's like this, a female patient who is on PD for quite, doing quite well, 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 and suddenly the catheter stops. Think of it, it's either a fallopian tube or momentum. So the fallopian tube or momentum comes just immediately. One day they're fine, the next day it goes out. So that's, you know the diagnosis is fallopian tube or momentum. Here, you may try to do your maneuvers, you can get the patient deconstipated and all, but it may not work. And this unfortunately may have to go to the OR because then the fallopian tubes or the omentum may have to be fixed. That is omentopexy or fallopian tubes have to be uh, pulled on together and have to separate the catheter from the fallopian tubes. Okay, what else can be a problem? So I have shown the figure here, which is the erosion of the superficial cuff. Remember the superficial cuff can come out and this is really painful for the patients because they feel it irritated. They feel that the skin is always getting extend, like uh, stretched. It's really not a good feeling for the patient. So that's why if you get this, 
just pull the catheter out, get the superficial cuff shaved off by using either a blunt, um, something to file it, or you can use sandpaper as well. Now I haven't used sandpaper because I'm too scared to use it because of the infection, but you can use, be careful about using a very blunt forceps to get it. Sometimes when you want to shave this catheter, you can nick the catheter. Unfortunately, I've done that in the past, but uh, I get smarter <laughs> as you go on. What is the infusion pain? So what is the infusion pain is when the fluid starts getting in, the patient gets pain. And the reason why it happens is because of two main reasons. One thing is if there's a jet of fluid goes in and it irritates the bowel or the peritoneum, which is slightly inflamed, or else it's the pH of the fluid, which is like acidic, right? 5.1 or 5.2 is a pH. Then here, you may want to change the fluid to from a dianil to physionil, which is a, a better pH. pH. And that might actually help with the physio, uh, infusion pain. Uh, if it is because of the CAPD and because it's a jet, you may want to get the level of the CAPD a bit lower. That might help because the jet uh, force will be less. Then is the drain pain. Drain pain means it was the it happens usually in the cycler machines. The reason is because the cycler it sucks the fluid out. When it's trying to suck the fluid out, it may actually get the peritoneum uh, sucked in and that causes the drain pain. So the way to avoid a drain pain, as I mentioned last time, is to get something known as a tidal volume, which is 85% or 90%. means you leave some amount of fluid back into the belly and then uh, uh, remove the rest of the fluid. So in a nutshell, what do you treat is Aggressive bowel regimen is number one, two, three, is the patient's poop has to come out. Feces has to be out, means out. Then if you're still not getting it, use TPA, get a uh, abdominal x-ray to see what's the position, make sure the kings or stools, and it's still not, unfortunately, the patient has to go to the OR to get it manipulated. By the way, when the patient goes to the OR to get manipulated, it doesn't mean that you have to stop the PD. You may, it all depends on how much is the urine output, okay? So you, if the patient has a urine output for like a good amount, like, 500 or one liter, you just have to hold the PD for two, three days. The patient can tolerate it, okay? And then you can restart it with just low, vol low volumes. Okay, hernias, leaks, and hydrothorax. Uh, I will go ahead with this and then I'll take a break, okay? So what are hernias? Hernias, as we know, is protrusion out of, uh, from the cavity, which holds uh, from the sides, okay? And why does a hernia happen in PD? Is because you have got large dilated volumes if the patient is sitting remember in the sitting position the volume the pressure is maximum so if the patient is sitting and trying to uh, exert or coughs or like is trying to pee then you get higher pressures if the patient is doing isometric exercise that means if you're trying to do exercising while you're sitting down position you can get hernia as well also as we know is going to raise your internal pressure if the patient has a recent abdominal surgery that's going to be a defect in the abdominal vasculature can lead to hernias. If the catheter has been used too early as compared to the traditional two weeks in normal or four weeks in the diabetics or illness of patients, those can get hernias too. Obesity patients can get hernias if the patient has got a fat and sometimes if the musculature is not very strong, they can get hernias. Deconditioning means if the patient has lot, lost a lot of weight and that means the musculature is getting weaker, then it can cause a diabetication of the recti and get leads to uh, hernias. Multiparity in female patients and then congenital abnormal receptors, as we know, is like uh, uh, patients with prune belly syndrome or other uh, abdominal wall problems. So what hernias can you get? You can get epigastric hernia, you get incisional hernia, you can get umbilical hernia, you get inguinal hernia, which are direct and indirect, and you can get femoral hernias. These are hernias which are seen outside, my friends. There are hernias which come inside as well. And those are the ones which can be not known. And though those will manifest only when the PD started, okay? The problem is this hernia, which is the, as you can see, there's an incision here and there's a umbilical. So this is an umbilical hernia, which is the biggest risk factor for incarceration. So we are very particular when you look at this hernia, and it's not uncommon to find the umbilical hernia even in normal people. Those are the very risk, highest risk factor for incarceration. I got this slide from my mentor, Dr. Bargman, and she always mentions that this is something that you should be looking out for. So this is the similar way, as you can see, there's a small defect and there's a hernia here, and this is with a dry abdomen, okay? So 
just to see show that this is an incarceration there's a loop of the bowel as you can see there's a, a differential gas and the uh, stuff here which is actually can give us to severe tender abdomen and not only that it can lead to peritonitis so a corollary to that is if you get a multi means polymicrobial uh, peritonitis always look for some hernias okay you may find one of them okay so what are the other hernias like you can see that this is an incision and the patient has developed a hernia here okay other way is see at this the patient is on the side and there's a some surgery happening here um, uh, it looks like this was a pedic catheter which is ca ca causing the pedic catheter and this is caused hernia here okay now this was a very interesting patient this is an internal hernia so we never knew this patient and this happened about four, four or five months back this patient was started on PD, really nice gentleman, 83 year old. We started on dialysis. After starting the dialysis, within a few days, he's complaining of shortness of breath. We thought it is hydrothorax. So yeah, it is fine. Now, hydrothorax usually happens on the right side, not on the left side. Very rarely it can happen on the left side. But we are surprised to find this. It is uh, intestines in the lung because there was some defect in the uh, diaphragm, which was not shown earlier. On the scans and then when if you put in the fluid that all the intestines went up and that caused a shortness of breath okay as you can see on the lateral side you can see that the colon is up here and the fluid is down here okay so how do you manage hernias in the patient with pd you always instruct the patients about the red flags of incarceration so always tell them that, look you got this swelling it may get bigger it may get red tender or you may not eat, uh, you may not uh, pass bowel movements, or you may not, you may have vomiting, or you may not even pass gas. If that thing happens, please come back. Or else, if an inguinal hernia, which is there, you always tell the patient, if it doesn't reduce, come to the hospital. And as I mentioned, if you get a polymicrobial peritonitis, look for incarcerated hernias. What happens when you do the hernia repair? When you have a hernia repair, it's not that you have to switch to HD. Just look at the urine output. If the urine output is good enough, you can safely hold the PD for a few days. I, we have held the PD for a week or so as well. And then you always start with low volumes and always put the patient in supine position so that the patient is then not in the sitting position or they're not in the standing position. So that sitting is because raised intraoperative pressure and standing is because you can leak. That's why let, let the patients lie in supine, start with a low volume. Like if the patient is on two liters initially, you may start like 750 or a liter because even that is sufficient to get the edge of the uremia or the potassium or anything. Okay, so start low volumes and make sure the patient is supine and do it for eight to ten hours so that the patient gets it done. And usually we use cycler here. Okay, and as the patient is not leaking and as he gets time, make sure that the patient is eating well, his uh, uh, musculature is good. Make sure he's not constipated, and you can slowly, gradually increase the fill volumes to to, uh, to, to the, its baseline over the next two to three weeks. Okay, coming to leaks. So what are leaks? So leaks are either in the abdomen, wall, or in the pericatheter. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that there's a leak here. In this leak, what will happen is individuals in the abdomen wall, the patient will gain weight. You will not have ultrafiltration. Means because the fluid goes inside the abdominal wall, okay, not in the belly, it has gone into the belly, but it doesn't come out. That means it is in the abdominal wall. And then you feel that belly, abdomen. It is too much edematous. You feel it boggy. You put on the finger there, you see that edema there. That's the leak. Okay. And it's the fluid accumulation in the abdominal wall. And that's not supposed to happen. And then you can also see that there's an asymmetry of the abdomen. What does that mean? Is look at here. You see this pretty catheter here? It's going in and see the swelling here. It's asymmetry here as compared to this side. You can see the most slightly uh, less, uh, you can see the wrinkles here, but here you can't see anything. And the other thing is like you see is this imprint of the catheter, okay? If you get the imprint of the catheter, my, my mentor, Dr. Bargain always says that this is her sign that tells you that this probably patient has a leak there, okay? Now coming to what is pericatheter. Pericatheter leak means if the exit side shows fluid, it's not pus, but it's a clear fluid. And if the dressing is wet, that means the patient has developed pericatheter leak. And how does it look? It can be just like a small, like a fluid, uh, the uh, uh, swab is wet, 
or else it can be big leak like this. Like this is uh, this patient is currently admitted in my hospital right now, and this is a lady who we had done a PD in the patient. She has ascites as well, and she was having tense ascites. So we used it, I think, in two or three weeks before the thing uh, healed. So we were happy because we were doing the paracentesis. We would stop the PD because she thought of renal function, and we were using this PD catheter as a paracentesis Tenshkov catheter. Look what happened. It leaked. And so one of the smart nurses did was she put up a colostomy bag here, which was a colostomy bag so that it, because otherwise she was soiling her um, bed. But what happened was the colostomy bag was collecting all the fluid here and look what is happening here. The, all the transfer set and everything is in this. The patient did get some infection now, okay? So this is not supposed to happen, but it happened. So getting smarter now, we know that colostomy bag is not a good idea now. So we should remove it uh, that day itself, but all the damage was done. So we make sure that nothing happens uh, this uh, next time. So the lessons learned here, if you start using a PD catheter sooner than two weeks in normal population or more than sooner than uh, four weeks, then you can get a leak here, okay? Especially if the patient has a weak musculature like a patient with cirrhosis or uh, any other malnutrition patient. Okay, now what will happen if the leak happens in the abdominal wall. Obviously the fluid goes down to the scrotum in the males and labia in the females. So this is how do you diagnose it? You put some uh, 100 ml VZ-Pak dye, which is a uh, uh, contrast into the peritoneum with the peritoneum and then you leave it for two to three hours, ask the patient to like walk, uh, sit, Basically, you try to get the hernia there and then you do a CT scan and you can see, as you can see, this is a scrotum. It's actually come into the scrotal wall here, okay? Now, coming to what is hydrothorax. So hydrothorax means the fluid has come to the thorax. It's not supposed to happen, but it happens. Like less than 5% of the patients will have channels which are draining from the abdomen to the thorax because of the subdiaphragmatic channels here. It always almost always happens on the right side, okay? It can happen on the left side as well, but almost always ha happens on the right side. So what you do is the patient, like I had this patient about a few years back in which she came in for training. The first day we put in two liters, she got severe short of breath and immediately the diagnosis was uh, hydrothorax. It was the X-ray showed the full pleural effusion. We had to do thoracentesis. She came for PD, but she had to go through thoracentesis. What do you do is here, how do you treat it? So the treatment is you try to put the patient in supine again. The reason is because it's the intraperitoneal pressure which pushes the fluid inside. So don't try to push the patient, uh, keep the patient in sitting but or standing. Try to get in, in uh, supine. It may heal by itself. If the patient is in fresh start on dialysis, you may just hold the dialysis for uh, some time because sometimes when the fluid is inside this chest cavity, it will act as a sclerosin agent, which is like an autosclerosin. Or else you may want to do something on the sclerodesis in which you put in the needle and then you put the talc or tetracycline or biomycin or autologous blood, which will ir irritate the pleura and will cause uh, inflammation and cause uh, uh, fibrosis. Or else you'll have to get a surgeon to do a pretty pleura. And sometimes the channels are very obvious, sometimes they're not obvious, and they essentially end up striping the uh, pleura from the diaphragmatic surface, disrupting all the uh, disrupting all the channels, and that actually helps, okay? Having said that, it's this is not the end and all for a PD. We do have patients who had a hepatic, uh, who had a hydrothorax, and we did the surgery with the pleurodesis or the uh, surgeries, and they are on PD as well now, many years later. Okay. Now coming to one of the most nastiest complications, which is known as encapsulating peritoneal sclerosis. And this is a real serious complication. What happens here is because there's a fluid in the belly, which is a, a pH of 5.1 and there is glucose inside, which causes non-physiological there. It actually causes a lot of problems there. And the problems can be happening not immediately, but will come after usually one or two years, sometimes it's, they say it's like three years, but we have seen it happening in like three months or six months as well. I'll tell you what the patient presents as it presents as nausea, vomiting and small bowel obstruction and leads to malnutrition because the patient just cannot eat, it keeps on vomiting because the patient has bowel obstruction. And the diagnosis is a CT scan, it does show something on the scacooning and in 
also there's a thickening of the peritoneum, there's a tethering of the small bowel and the pockets. What is important to understand is it can happen even if the patient has stopped the PD many years back, months back, it can happen post transplant. So if the patient has a, this EPS, the therapy one is immunosuppression, but you can have post transplant as well. So we are not sure whether the immunosuppression would help or not help. Okay. They say that peritoneal inflammation is a second hit, which can happen anytime later after the first hit of being a peritoneum. Okay. And what they say is, is the pathogenesis is increased fibroblast. So this is the CT scan. Okay. So what does it show is you see this lining of the bowels. Okay. So this lining is there, which is thickened and calcified. If it is more than two mm of the thickened, thickened um, uh, bowel loops, it is significant. Here it is all calcified, as you can see, and it's, as you can see, it's all like a cocoon here. Okay, you can see it's a cocooning, and then they also mention what is known as tethering. Tethering means here you can see this small, 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 small. Uh, like if the ball gets pulled, it's like you got a sausage and you start putting the uh, strings around and try to pull it the way it does is known as tethering. Also, if you can see the fluid levels, like this fluid here and this fluid here, which is not supposed to be like in the compartments, and that's what you see, as you can see it here, is one of the signs. So you, you should get ball thickening, calcification, or fluid compartments, and those are the signs of uh, 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 this peritoneal sclerosis and capsulating peritoneal sclerosis. Unfortunately, it doesn't end well so you may you have to convert to hemodialysis. Now there are papers from Japan which say, which say that why don't we just continue with PD because PD if there's any inflammation inside will just remove uh, it will uh, inflame it will drain the peritoneum. What's more important is it's a focus on the nutrition. Many a times the the candidates are not surgical candidates, and you may have to give her them uh, total parenteral nutrition. People have tried small dose steroids or tamoxifen, but again, tamoxifen comes with its own side effects of DVTs. Uh, sometimes if the patient is really having abnormal distension, you may get a surgical opinion to get um, adhesive lysis, but again, the adhesive lysis and it, it actually sets up a vicious cycle. Uh, if the patient gets transplanted, well, you can consider non-fibrotic immunosuppressants, which are nothing but serolimus and evolimus, rather than using the tacrolimus or uh, cyclosporin, which are uh, fibrotic in nature. Coming to the metabolic complications. So what are the metabolic complications that a patient can have is one thing is weight gain. And usually what happens is the patients gain weight after the, within the first year, and they can get almost like anywhere between five to 10 kgs, sometimes 13 kgs. And, uh, uh, it's associated with uh, diabetes and rapid decline in the renal function and it's actually shown to have even mortality. So it is sometimes it's good when the patients gain weight, but also not good if they're having high diabetes or anything. The other thing is they can, because peritoneal dialysis is associated with protein loss, albumin is lost six to eight grams a day and that can be your rest malnutrition. Okay. It is more in patients with PD peritonitis because, because of the peritonitis, there's inflammation, and then you can lose almost like 30, 40 grams of protein in the peritoneum. In that situation, if you are losing so much protein there, you may want to stop the uh, PD there okay, for some time till the peritonitis settles. How can you get malnourished is because if you can get glucose absorption from the PD, you, it can cause the glucose levels to go up and the patient may feel nausea and they may get a reflux and they can have delayed gastric emptying and also medications like uh, sevelamir or the calcium permanent or calcium acetate that we give for phosphate bindings then get, give rise to anorexia, nausea and that causes malnutrition. What about lipids? Because the glucose gets absorbed and gets formed into uh, triglycerides and then LDL, you always get this hypertriglyceridemia. Okay? And what has been shown is try to avoid using the high glucose levels uh, high glucose uh, tonicity by using icodextrin because that is associated with less T, uh, triglycerides, VLDL, and apolipoproteins. What about hypokalemia? So patients with PD usually have hypokalemia with almost like 10, 30%. And the reason is because it's a continuous dialysis. Then you give <laughs> laxatives as well. You give diuretics as well because they are peeing. And there's a shift because of the patient has got high glucose levels. So they have got insulin as such on board. Or sometimes the patient may not be eating food and that's a poor diet in check. And this is been associated with gram-negative peritonitis, as I mentioned, because of the 
uh, stasis of the intestines and it has been associated with all cause mortality as well so please make sure that the patient is not getting hypokalemic you treat it with oral uh, kcl avoid intraperitoneal kcl you can use I ip but better to avoid it because it's a high risk for infections now if the patient is hypokalemic and you start uh, treating it it actually doesn't have any effect on the mortality okay we may think that to treat hypokalemia is better but it has not shown to have any effect on the mortality the levels of hypokalemia can be 2.8 2.9 or 3 3.1 as well okay so the other things that you can get is metabolic acidosis as you can see and they can be both iron gap and normal iron gap and is associated with hypokalemia hyponatremia is possible because of the high glucose levels and it's because of the hypotension and is associated with weight loss and depression condition and you can have hyponatremia due to the sodium cv which usually ha happens because of the rapid action to so avoid using a rapid action what is atypical bone disease is patients with diabetes and kd can get atypical bone disease because of the advanced glycation disorder hypoglycemia or diabetes or positive calcium balance what you do is make sure that you are using a low calcium balance okay now coming to the last topic is kd capsule color the first is this if a female comes with this you think what is this this is hemoperitoneum and the reason for this is if the patient is on coagulopathy or has retrograde menstruation or ovulation or exercise structural variations or sometimes malignancy as well what is this this is powdery peritoneum which is nothing but our infection but other things can be drugs allergic reaction retrograde disease like pancreatitis or any interpreted like appendicitis or the status never forget about the uh, reasons for the cloudy uh, abdomen if it is pilus that means it is high triglycerides lymphatic obstruction trauma or abdominal lymphomas and pancreatitis drugs and this is our normal fluid so always remember this should be clear and you should be able to read through it if you are not able to read through it that means there is some problem and the last is that i will show is something known as aggression induced in rash which can manifest as differently just can present as redness acute or sometimes exfoliation as well so with this i have tried to finish my talk and i really thank my teachers dr jan bagman dr roger burkar my pd unit here and my mentors and colleagues and these are the sources and you want to give the address uh, there's one question uh, 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 to sir uh, that pd actually i have used in patients with congestive heart failure who are recurrent heart failures you know and admissions because of heart failure and it is actually instead of using continuous high dose diuretics uh, i've used it for ultra filtration just one cycle a day of uh, pd fluid and uh, not even for four hours actually for a two hour period and it has helped a lot and this patient has actually gone on uh, you know the hospitalization rates have come down except that finally she had one episode of peritonitis and uh, i know and uh, actually we lost her after that because she was really frail Uh, so that was, and then nutrition wise, she improved as well. So that was one thing I found, you know, out of the books, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, which was very useful. And this was actually I saw this with Dr. Tobe in the unit about, you know, when I was uh, way back, you know, and uh, I did have this in India. But cardiologists are really not for it. You know, that's one thing I saw. Yeah, well, um, I agree. Like we have cardiorenal syndrome patients on PD. and they they started sending the patients to me because i'm doing pd and uh, usually if the patient is a cardiorenal syndrome they'll send to me because uh, even one as you as you mentioned one one uh, like 12 hours of hypodexion is so much helpful one thing is it's uh, preserves the uh, urine output it helps the ultrafiltration third thing is the patient feels better and fourth thing is you don't have to uh, like the blood pressure fluctuations are not that terrible the weight is well maintained the quality of life is so well better with the one side one or two session uh, one or two uh, cycles of pd for a patient of cardiorenal syndrome i agree with you
Thank you, Dr. Tusha, for this uh, interesting talk. And um, it is quite elaborate that we have been, you have taken us through the basics in the first part and, and you've shown us the issues and problems that might happen with uh, PD and how to troubleshoot this. It has been quite uh, enlightening talk and um, I'm happy that we've been able to get uh, participants from different parts of the world, including Dr. Mubaraka from UK. So thank you very much. I would like to take this opportunity again to thank you for gracing us with these two talks and Dr. Lloyd for organizing this and AHN for all their support through this uh, uh, educative uh, webinar fire chats. And I think we have, we have been uh, fortunate to learn a lot through these uh, talks. Um, thank you very much. So may I welcome Dr. Lloyd and Makwabi if they have any announcement before we close the session. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, thank you. I think uh, we should just uh, close the session. Thank you very much for uh, participating and for giving this talk, uh, Dr. Tushan. We'll probably keep in touch and we're looking forward to hearing from you again in future. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Tushan. Thank you, Dr. Francis. Thank you, Dr. Lloyd. And uh, bye, everybody. Bye.